Hello, thank you for joining us for this virtual program in conversation, Elliot Reed and Joshua Oduga. I'm Joshua Oduga, the Public Programs and Exhibitions Manager at Art and Practice, and we are very excited to share this virtual talk with you. This program is organized in association with Art and Practice's current exhibition, Blondo Cummings Dance as Moving Pictures, a co-presentation with the Getty Research Institute. The exhibition is on view until February 2022. For this program, we welcome artist Elliot Reed for an intimate conversation around their work and practice. Hi, Elliot. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm excited to join this call and uh, record and talk about some work with you. Yeah, very excited. I, I should mention to everyone that you are an artist and director um, based in New York City, but you're currently not in New York City right now. Um, your work assembles bodies, movement and narrative within exhibition spaces and various other spaces, um, wielding performance as a tool. Um, I became familiar with your work here in Los Angeles, seeing it in various different spaces. Um, I think myself very much encountering you as a musician back in the early days. Um, so I wanted to start this conversation by talking a little bit about the origins of your practice um, and the work that you're doing, the way that you see it. Um, so yeah, can you talk to me about when you first started engaging in like artistic practices and, and sharing work? Right, um, well, the first time I started working creatively, I always attribute to my grandmother on my mom's side. Um, she was an organist for the church that we grew up going to, and she actually gave me my first piano lessons. And from what I remember, I don't, re I don't really recall being a super hyperactive kid, but uh, I definitely know that music was a place where I could sit down and concentrate in front of the piano. And it was great to have that extra bonding time too. So um, yeah, playing piano, I think was the first creative space I had as a kid learning notes and you know music and stuff like that and then once I got into high school I actually started composing so I started writing original music for the piano and towards the end of my time in high school I started working with electronics so I was using samplers and using free software I could find on my computer and trying to like record things that I would make on the piano um, that developed into songs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that that's where it began. And then um, I guess I can keep going. So for me I, 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 I want to jump in really quick because what yeah. I think is really interesting is I think you kind of started off really and we're thinking about composing, um, starting yeah. off at the piano, thinking about the organ as like your, your first in instrument and the piano as your first instrument. I think that's really interesting, especially with my knowledge of like some of the software that you mentioned, free and you know, open source, source software that you can find online. Um, I think oftentimes people come to those electronics first and then mm -hmm. from that they may learn about composition. Um, so I think it's really interesting for your work that you were considering yourself to be a composer already. Um, and then within that, you were looking for other tools and other means um, to, to make this work um, available and, and, and shared with other people. Um, one of the things I think that's really interesting is in your early electronic music compositions, which I'm familiar with, there seemed to be a lot of collaboration that was creeping in. Um, mm -hmm. And I think on one level, when you're using software and you're using tools like that, it is a collaboration. It's a collaboration with the people who designed it and, and all of those things. Um, so I wonder how quickly in that learning, in that process, did you also start thinking about other forms of, of where your music and the composition were going to be presented? How, how quickly did performance and visual aspects come into that? Well, I think it actually came late. It's funny, it was, uh, so when I was, when I left art school and like first started performing more electronic music on my own, I always had a desire to sing um, as part of my performance practice, but was, really self-conscious about my voice. So my first musical performance, like debut performance I did was actually in Chicago, Illinois, where I was living at the time. I had a third floor apartment where me and my roommates also had access to the attic. 
and it had a side uh, door that you could enter from the street. So we would throw shows there. I remember we booked this band called Queening. I don't think they're a band anymore, but it was like a two piece from New York that was on tour and then a couple local bands. And then I just decided to throw myself on the bill since it was at my house. So like very, very DIY, but the first time I collaborated with people at that show was when I actually had invited my old roommate and a few friends of mine for the weeks leading up to the performance, I was writing songs with each of them individually. And it was kind of nice. Like I would do something solo then at different points during the set, I would do a song with Raphael and then I do a song with Wuri and then go back to doing my own thing. So I think that's where the collaboration started, but sort of all this desire that I felt I needed a proxy or some kind of like, <laughs> like another body to kind of perform through just because I wasn't so confident using my own voice. Uh, but from that, I got really into programming, playing synthesizers, um, drum machines, writing my own music, making my own sounds. And that is such a deeply personal and really private endeavor. It's social when it when you get to play it live, but um, it was interesting. It was like that energy kind of like inverted and that became a big core of my studio practice was just spending time with all these electronics and just crafting sounds from scratch. Um, and then later on, I started to sing more and write music and sing. Um, and then there was another transition after that, but I'll pause again. Yeah, definitely. I feel like you were doing all of this organizing in like DIY spaces and that must have been inspired in, on a certain level as well, right? Like being around that environment and inviting other people in, um, thinking about that. I, I could totally see how that turned into then a solitary thing when you went back into the work and you went back to the tools that you were using, um, which is really interesting because I think when I first encountered your work, um, myself being an, an electronic musician, one of the things that I was really interested in are the tools that you were using um, and the way that you were applying this and then the language that you were using to talk about the work that you were doing. I think you kind of got into that a little bit when you were talking about needing to have a proxy in terms of creating electronic music and, and doing that. And I think I'm just very, in the beginning processes of researching and doing work on other electronic musicians and four, four founders of um, the work that's being created now. And there's a ton of that when you look at like underground resistance and, and other groups. And uh, come on underground resistance. I love them. I mean, there's such a rich history of um, really boundary pushing, like super intelligent black musicians, like specifically from the Midwest, which I was really inspired by. Like yeah. I've loved like rock music and stuff, but what, what you mentioned, like underground music resistance, really famous Detroit um, techno collective, electronic music, also like Drexia, which is amazing um, for a lot of people listening who don't know. Uh, there, I feel like I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna write something about this at some point because uh, I know there's like debates on like who invented house music and this, that and the other, but there, there's a really specific energy within the black POC community where in places like Chicago, Detroit, but even like you know Minneapolis, Milwaukee, where people kind of, I don't know if it's the cold weather or what, but like folks were really kind of taking these new technologies because this is a time, you know, if you think of like the 80s and 90s, early 2000s, like it was before YouTube. So if you wanted to learn how to use an MS2000 Korg synthesizer or something, you couldn't just watch a tutorial for it. You had to buy it read the manual, understand how to use MIDI programming. And this is actually like super technical work. So I know you understand this, but um, I, I feel like I need to speak out on it because it's like a history I don't want to be lost. And definitely like a, a lineage that I see myself a part of, even though I'm not making so much electronic music now, there's a really deep spirit and history of ingenuity um, with actually super high tech stuff, which maybe some people don't know about. Um, and even too, like, um, you know, it's not techno, but like, you can think of Prince, like from Minneapolis, there, there's a whole part of his practice and his work that maybe some people aren't aware of beyond just being a good songwriter. Um, running your own recording studio is not an easy thing to do. And, you know, they're called and sound engineers for a reason, right? Because it's, you know, an extremely technical job to know what kind of microphones to use to record different instruments. And, you know, these machines are not, like you look at some of these things that someone like, like Prince or someone like Juan Atkins or something like programmed a song on, it looks like a, a, a VCR player, 
like not something friendly. Everyone's used to touch screens now. Um, and then, okay, one more thing I'll say about this, like the fact that black musicians, like people of color were able to not only use these extremely, you know, challenging new technologies to create music, but actually could create narratives and stories behind it. And, you know, like no shade to craft work. I love craft work, but like, I think at least in the US, people were able to push it beyond like a techno fetish space and actually like really bring um, different histories, different stories, different narratives, different characters and kind of like a playfulness um, to the music that that really just um, every day it, it inspires me to think it's like, wow, this is literally just some some person, you know, and sometimes sometimes it's kids like, you know, 20 years old, yeah. save up their yeah. money and are just like, working their asses off to make really amazing, complicated music that no one's ever heard before because synthesizers are still new, right? And you know, your mom can't tell you how to play the synthesizer. It's like, you know, you're learning. I, yes, <laughs> all of that. What happened might be a different talk. A really interesting sense of community starts to happen because it's like, what kind of gear do you have? What, what do you have? Let's come together. I, I don't know how to use it. Teach me how to use it. Um, I think it becomes, in it in its own self a really interesting form of education um educating yourself and, and you know when you're trying to build another world and you're trying to build some form of sustainability for yourself as well because i think one thing that's important to mention in all of this is that while the individuals that we've mentioned were using the tools and all that they're also building uh, a means of commerce for themselves which i think is really important when you think about record labels and drexia um they were selling records and people were selling this stuff not here in america like in overseas, there was a lot of opportunity for this medium to be consumed. Um, so I think one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about and to kind of move it back to, to your work specifically is to spend some time talking a little bit more about your studies. And when I mention studies, I think that's not necessarily in, in an institution. It's like things that you're doing on your own to acquire knowledge um, in the spaces that you're, you're operating in. Um, and I think what was really interesting and exciting for me is I was following your work for a while and then you became an artist in residence at the Studio Museum. Um, so for me, that's like a really, really amazing <laughs> educational opportunity. Um, and so I wanted to really talk and give you space to talk about the means that you're using to acquire knowledge and, and how you're putting that into your work. Sure. I mean, uh, I would call myself a, an autodidact. That's only like half true because there's a lot of things I taught myself, but um, I guess desire was kind of my main teacher. I was lucky to have a grandmother who played music and taught me how to play. But like beyond that, I had just, you know, like piano teachers through elementary school, high school. I had one really amazing teacher, shout out to Win Ann Rossi when I was in probably, I don't know, maybe sixth grade to 12th grade, if that long, maybe less, but I think she was one of the first people who pushed me to kind of compose um, and saw that I, you know, I, I love, I love to focus, but I hate to practice, if that makes sense. <laughs> so I'm the kind of person where it's like, I, I don't like being told what to do, but I also don't like being told no. So I, I realized kind of early on that something needs to get done either it's not important to me and I don't do it, or I will stay up for days straight and just make sure it happens. So it, that's kind of the tricky thing with learning music because there's a lot of rules after a certain point. And you know, if you want to get good, you have to improve your technique and practice. But what was so great about Winan is that I still got to practice playing the piano, but um, when she saw, saw me kind of start to buck a little bit at going through like, okay, now play Beethoven. Now, now we're going to try this like Chopin piece or whatever. It's like, she noticed that I was playing a lot of things by ear and was doing a lot of improvising. And so her way of getting me back into technique was challenging me to actually write and transcribe the things that I was making on the piano already. And basically through the back door, I had to learn music theory because it's the only way to, you know, write, I would use a pen and pencil or a pencil and paper and like write down on staff paper. I mean, since then that, that skill has kind of like, you know, <laughs> gone somewhere deep into the recesses of my mind but yeah. um so yeah that I guess that but that was a formative educational experience and I think that really set me on a track to feel like I could use whatever was at my disposal to make something um also being really active in the DIY do-it-yourself music community in Chicago Illinois which at the time I was there 
was pretty cool. Are you are you familiar with the website Pitchfork, the music yeah. website? Yeah, so they're based in Chicago, but at the time they were still independent. Recently they were purchased by Condé Nast, which owns like Vogue and all these other huge publications. So even though they were super popular, I think the culture around the website and also the music festival felt a little more legitimately independent. Um, now there's a big thing for music artists where you have to sign like a, a, a proximity clause in your contract. Like if you're if you're booked to play a big festival like Coachella or Pitchfork or Lollapalooza or something, um, there's these contracts that artists have to sign that for sometimes up to a whole year, if not a few months, they're not allowed to play within like a 350 mile radius of like a concert because these big companies want people to spend money to go to their shows and not see the same bands at a bars for like ten dollars but i remember now this is probably like yeah like 15 years ago or so like there was bands that were kind of popular and were touring and could play these big festivals were still linked in to like the underground like punk scene so it's like you could see a band that was headlining Lollapalooza and then they do like a secret show in my neighborhood on the southwest side like for free um now it's like you know not so easy for things to do that but this all connects. So basically the this sort of communal way of like doing things. It's yeah. like if you were in if you were in the know or like in this in the scene, I guess you're like, okay, no, like don't don't spend three hundred dollars. It's like it's a secret, but like if you come to like this this place on Thursday night, like XYZ is gonna be there. Um and also to my first shows, it was before Instagram, before Facebook, which like now it feels like it's always been here, but that wasn't the case. So in order to get people to come to things, I actually made flyers and I would go to, go to yeah. events, hand them out to people and sort of like a, a one-to-one, you know, communication or just like really if I booked a band from like, you know, Iowa or some other faraway place, I don't know, that like you'd sell it like, oh yeah, like supersonic piss is playing. They're super harsh. You're going to love it. Like there's another band that's playing. It's going to be wild, you know, and you're just like, on, on the move a little bit. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I think yeah. of what you're talking about, like nowadays it's just in, in contemporary art and in all different sorts of practices, there's this idea of self-sustainability. Like you know, right. you're doing contemporary art to be seen in the gallery you can do an artist run space and, and operate yeah. that way. Um, it sounds to me that your formative education and, and all of that happened in two different spaces, like in a very much kind of traditional educational manner when you were learning with teachers and you were becoming a composer in that traditional right. sense. But then at the same time, you were in these DIY spaces and really operating in a way that, like you were saying, it, it allows you to think in so many different levels as a graphic designer, as a, a promoter, as an mm -hmm. artist yourself, um, yeah. all of these different things. Um, so I think it's really interesting when I talk to people like yourself who are doing that, how there's a constant need to constantly be educating yourself and, and still be learning so much and still be doing so much. That's why I think it's really great that you engage in opportunities like the Studio Museum and things like that. And one of the things that I was not so familiar with that I wanted to talk to you about um, is your work as an educator um, as well. I know that you have worked on some projects uh, with Jack Studio and specifically like high school students at the Kaufman Music Center. Um, and I think that all of these things that we have talked about are really interesting in terms of then going into doing something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to show a little bit of a video of you working with some students and then we can talk about it a little bit if that's okay. Great. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, so I really, really enjoyed that piece uh, for a lot of different reasons. Oh, let me stop it. I think I, I watched that and I didn't know that you studied as a composer at such a young age and you were already composing at such a young age. Um, I just learned that in this conversation that we're having now. So I'd love for you to first talk to me about the origins of that, like what people were just seeing there. Um, and then I have some other follow-up questions as well. Sure. So that clip you showed uh, just now was me working with an extremely special group of high school students in Manhattan uh, at this uh, institution called the Kaufman Music Center, which you mentioned. So all those students are part of a program called Face the Music, where students from all boroughs of New York City are able to audition to be part of an after school program uh, that focuses on technique. They offer private lessons, but also teach kids how to work in ensembles and compose if that's what they want to do um, at a lot of different levels. But everyone who is there, super focused, super talented. This is like on top of going to school five days a week. They come in on Sundays to do like three hours of like music, uh, which is amazing. And part of the program is they have a, a commissioning wing. So they bring in artists to do original works with the students. So sometimes it's composers will bring work they've made for other ensembles uh, and have the students perform it. Or in my case, I made a new work to go with the students. So what I propose to them is, so okay, so we were talking about my background in music and now this piece is recent, it's from 2020, where I'm now working more contemporary art spaces, doing performance. Um, what you saw was a way of me blending my recent work in choreography and performance art and translating it into experimental music. So the piece was inspired by a lot of 20th century com uh, composite composers and artists, Fluxus, like people like Benjamin Patterson, also the work of John Cage, um, Yoko Ono, like uh, these sort of process-based experimental art makers. Um, the music that you heard them play was a really interesting process each of the students went through individually. I made this piece by interviewing the students as a group, asking them questions such as, what's the name of the building, or sorry, what's the number of the building you live in on your street? So for example, if they lived at 324 XYZ Lane, um, that's a bad example, 324 Grape Lane. So Grape starts letter G, G is a note. So I would have them compose an improvised phrase that starts with the note G, and then they would play that um, in a three, four time signature or something. So I, each time I'd ask people how many, how many siblings they have, people's heights, if they have food allergies, like a very, just like I'm talking to you and sort of by using these conversations, I would take this back home, uh, turn it into notes and kind of make it into music. But the nice thing about it is that there was a built-in mnemonic device and all the students had a personal attachment to the sounds that they were making. Um, the gestures you were looking at, I worked with them on creating a system of numbers and symbols. So instead of reading sheet music from start to finish, the performance happened live because, for example, Mary Sue's gesture for number five would be different than like Michael Germain's gesture number. These are weird fake names, but whatever. Gesture number five. So uh, this kind of like a chance element or sort of unexpected element for the sound was my artistic proposal or my conceptual proposal to the students. It's like, we all know what music can be or what it's supposed to sound like, but what if instead of starting with a melody, we start with ideas or start with things that are personal narrative and just think of ways to like dissect it and build it and kind of create a composition out of this, this, this work. Yeah, that's really amazing. I think that also you've just really summarized a, a, some of the work that you make in a really beautiful way, the way that you're thinking about this. And I think it's really great that you then work with a group of, I'm assuming they're high school students that we saw. And yeah, they're all like, thir yeah, 13 to 17. And really challenging them to think about the conceptual means in which they're working with the instruments and the things that they're working with. Um, I think that that's really amazing. And I think it really also speaks to, to Blondell Cummings a little bit and what she was doing and, and why I wanted to reach out to you and have you be a part of this program series. Because um, I was thinking about 
all the different work that you make. We talk a lot, or we've talked a lot about the music that you make, uh, but as you mentioned, your practice now encompasses so many different things, uh, video, sculpture, installation, um, all of these things. And I think in all of it, there's a little bit of like, I, I wanna say problem solving. And that's just me, that's me that's saying that. It's a little bit of like, you know, trying to figure out lots of different things simultaneously. Um, and one of the things I think that's really interesting, and as I mentioned, what drew me to your work is the technical aspects of that, um, the te technology that you're using, um, even in movement, some of the movement work that you've done and in working with other collaborators who are dancers and, and you being a choreographer, in a sense, all of these things are really interesting. Um, and I've learned so much working on this exhibition and being in Blondell's work, um, being immersed in her work, I should say, about how oftentimes when you're working in these performative practices, there's an exchange that happens when you're working with people. Um, so I wanted to take it back to your time at the Studio Museum and talk a little bit about the duets project that you worked on there. Um, I spent a lot of time with that project as it was happening, um, kind of just like watching all the, the things that you were putting out. Um, and I'd love for you to talk about it in your own words and then we can explore little pieces of it um, by me sharing my screen, so go ahead. First off, uh, shout out Studio Museum, the coolest institution on earth. Um, sorry to every other institution I've worked with, past, present, and future. <laughs> they're, they're very, very special. And um, I just finished the residency last year, but it really feels like the, the benefits and community for that is just multiplying every year. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm every day, I'm just like, whoa. Because I, I remember even when I applied to go to art school, just like looking at looking at that, program and seeing like, whoa, like Simone Lee and David Hammond and all these people that like I'm really inspired by and just like, you know, to to be in that lineage, to have my name on the list every day. I'm just like, damn, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So yes, while I was at the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, the COVID-19 pandemic started. So I moved from Los Angeles to New York in 2019. Um, to start my time in the residency that around September, September, October, 2019. Um, and during that time in 2020, obviously March lockdown started, da 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 da. Uh, as part of my closing exhibition, which still happened uh, at MoMA PS1, which is sort of um, traditionally the artist in residence at the Student Museum in Harlem, spend a year working on new projects. And then at the end, there's an exhibition where you can kind of show what you've been doing. So our show is at PS1. I originally had planned a live performance, but that wasn't possible because of COVID restrictions. We couldn't have people gather. So I made an installation in the gallery that was video, sculpture, sound. But for the performance aspect, I did a series of works called duets, which you mentioned. So similar to how I was working with the high school students uh, in the last video you showed, duets started to me as a question or you know, to borrow, borrow your phrase as a problem that needed to be solved, right? So I'm like, okay, I normally perform on stage or in a room with groups of people, but because I can't, I'm legally not able to have a gathering in a public building, like in a museum, what is my audience? Or how can I think creatively about my restriction for having people gather in a room? So fast forward, working in the studio, thought about it, and I proposed this idea for duets. We're basically going through the protocol at MoMA PS1. I think up to two people could be in a room together masked at any given time uh, if it was within a certain size. So I was like, great, it'll be me, one other person for an hour, uh, we'll improvise a duet together. But what made the proposal unique is that there was five cameras inside of the room and what I added to this proposal was that we were doing a live feed of the camera angles. So the audience wasn't able to watch us because we were kind of hidden in a private room for safety reasons, but they could watch in the lobby of the museum on a monitor. And what they were watching on a monitor was a manipulated feed of the camera. So not only was me and the other person I was dancing with moving in real time, we were also controlling what was being seen. So we could like change the camera angles, have things stretch, them shrink, flip backwards. And so in that way, it's like I'm adding another layer of performance, like another layer of artifice um, in lieu of having a live audience. Yeah, I think that that's really interesting. And it, it adds another layer to the work that you do. Um, 
as a as a director, really thinking about the way that the output that you're you're creating is going to be perceived. And I think that's really interesting within an institutional space, a place like MoMA PS1. Um, and, and a lot of things happen at MoMA PS1 in terms of performance and, and thinking about that. So I think you're also working in a really interesting lineage in that space. Um, and one of the things that really struck me about the duets project it, are some of the individuals that you actually do edit with. Um, I think it's a really great group of people. Um, Raymond Pinto, Ismail Houston Jones, uh, Ron Athey, and Samantha CC. Can you talk to me a little bit about where the collaborations like originated from and why you thought about bringing on these individuals? Sure, well, those are all my friends, which helped, uh, especially like during such um, chaotic, a chaotic spring, like people I felt comfortable sharing space with and kind of communicating about having this uh, dialogue with. Um, so yeah, I mean, to be completely honest, that, that's kind of where it started. Uh, Ron Athey, that was special because he lives in Los Angeles um, we met in Minneapolis, that's a different story, but he actually was in town opening a show at Participant Inc. Uh, in New York City, it's a gallery there. I was performing in his video, and so we kind of traded off. I was in his piece, he was in my piece. Um, Samantha CC, I also met for the first time, we performed together at a place called Coaxial in LA, like in downtown LA, in maybe 2018, I wanna say. Um, but it, what was so great is that Samantha, she was actually pregnant with um, her now child. That was the first time we met. Um, it was before I knew I was moving to New York and then now we got to reconnect. And then Ishmael Houston Jones is legendary choreographer, dancer, um, one of like the, the kindest and, and most fun to talk to people I've ever met. But he, I got in contact with him through the Studio Museum um, he was my mentor for the year. Amazing. Um, Legacy Russell set us up together. So um, that's amazing. Of the many, many perks of that of that program. Each each person gets paired in, in, with a with a mentor. So that, that was my guy, and now we're still friends. Ishmael it has collaborated with Londo in the past. So that's mm -hmm. a really interesting thing that I thought was really amazing um, as well. And I think what you just mentioned it kind of goes back to what you were saying about your origins. Uh, and operating in these DIY spaces and thinking about this community. Um, so you're given this opportunity at the Studio Museum and, and you, you formulate a duet um, that you want to do, or multiple duets, I should say, um, and you go to your community, you go to your friends, um, and, and also individuals that you collaborated with in other DIY spaces, like a space like Coaxel, another really amazing space here in Los Angeles that supports um, performative practices and experimental practices. Um, and so I think it's really interesting. And I wanna just briefly show a little bit of some of these duets uh, really quickly. Sure. And it is a block. Um, therefore it is a green block. It is a block that is green. It is a green object that is a block. The block is green. Green is the block. Is it possible to stack together several blocks and make a different shape? Uh, I'll have to think about that. Uh, uh, I'm thinking. Like, yeah, I mean, I can think I'm visualizing a green block and I'm visualizing another green block and first they're side by side. And then if I can imagine putting the second green block on top of the first green block, right. then they're, they're two green blocks, one stacked upon the other. So okay. yeah, it should be possible, but I'm not 100% sure, like, but, I've never done it before, so I don't know if I know, can know anything that I've never done. Like, I believe in stacking. I think it's a very real possibility, the stack. Do, do, do you remember, you're, you, you might be too young, but do you remember that phase in New York restaurants, like really expensive restaurants where they stack the food and it looked really nice when the food came to your table, but it was impossible to eat without knocking the stacks over? 
That sounds like a dangerous game. It was really dangerous. It was, it was the same time when they were putting, they were squiggling sauces with squeezy bottles on the plates, which made cleaning the plates for dishwashers really, really, really hard. It was a horrible, horrible time in New York culinary history. Can you talk a little bit about what we just saw? Oh my God, I love Ishmael Houston Jones so much. He's so cool. I like every day, <laughs> he's someone whose work I really admired for years. Like the fact that we got to meet, there's no guarantee that we would like each other, but I'm glad we do. <laughs> so he's, I don't know. I just, yeah. Uh, yes. So that clip you showed was really great because I think it just kind of expresses to the people watching. The videos are all online for free if anyone wants to watch it. They're still hosted on the MoMA website. But uh, basically, yeah, it was just me, one other person in a room. And in that short clip, you could see I like changed the camera angles. I picked up uh, a microphone and moved it. I kind of slid some stuff around. So each piece is an hour. So within the course of an hour, there's like uh, some visual things that change. Um, and the score, the score for the duet was one hour, no rehearsal. It starts when the timer stops and it ends when the timer ends. And that's it, which is, you know, really fun for, for, for me, someone like me and also like uh, a lot of performers I know, but it can be challenging for people who are used to working with the script. Yeah, definitely. I, I wanted to ask you that as well, because I think it, what's really interesting is, is someone like Ishmael and then Ron, their work is, is so, composed in their very singular vision. And so you then bring them into your world. Um, and I think you do a really good job of doing that. In the clip that we saw with the kids and, and what you just explained of that, um, I think you do a really good job of bringing people into your world and, and figuring out these ideas that, that you're working on. Um, how is it from your experience to do that type of work, um, especially when you're constantly thinking about how it's gonna be perceived as well? Like how, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thank you first. That was a really nice compliment. And I really, that's something I, I take pride in because it doesn't always work, but it's great when, you know, um, people trust me, which is what it starts with because there's no, you know, yes, I pay people, but also, you know, no one has to say yes. <laughs> so every every time, you know, I, I, I show up with an idea and people are like, okay, I'm really gonna put my neck out here because the whole the whole point of the work is that like it's impossible to know what's gonna happen until it happens. Sometimes I do more composed things, but uh, yeah, I think trust trust is a big is is a big thing. Um, and sorry, you asked me how do how do I navigate that when I'm also concerned? Yeah, like because because you're thinking about that, you're thinking about you know, how people are going to trust you, how your collaborators are going to trust you. But then at the end of the day, you are a contemporary artist and you're making work that is to be consumed on one level. So that's like your, the final vision is always comes into play, right? So I think navigating those things, you do a really interesting way um, or you, you do that in a really interesting way. So I think you already answered exactly what I wanted yeah. to. Wanted I to will say. add to that though, is that I, I spend a lot of time doing profoundly unfun things in private but the goal is to, once I find a performer I wanna work with or an institution or a school or whatever that like asks me to do a piece, I do everything in my power to make sure that the people who come to work for me, it's as easy and free as possible. Of course I have goals, I have directions, but I think my style as a, as a choreographer, as a director, um, I've learned that people give the best performances when they're relaxed. And that requires a lot of legwork uh, beforehand by the director, but it's work that I'm willing to do in order to make sure that like the second anybody I work with shows up, that they feel supported, they feel free to like push their own limits to try something weird and uh, try something different. And I think the work that I'm doing both behind the scenes and also kind of in front of the camera is um, jumping in and out to try and suggest certain things for my performers, but to also kind of encourage them to, like if there's something I like, there's different ways I egg, egg it on, you know, like whether it's through my body language or through a direct uh, speech, like speaking to them. And so it, it's a constant, it's a constant game and development, but I think unintentionally for my years of working independently, and I, I don't, I'm not really sure, maybe I can, I'll know why, why I'm able to do this, like, by the time I die or something. 
but uh, it, it is a, it's a skill, it's an aesthetic. And I think the more I create performances, I'm realizing that this is just, you know, one of my tools is being able to kind of, you know, support people in doing things that they wouldn't normally do. Yeah. I don't know how much this applies to Ishmael Houston Jones because he's kind of everything when it comes to performing, but um, with the high school students and a lot of other people, the talent is there, the skill is there, like the, the energy is there. And so it's my job to sort of like look critically at what, what special thing everyone can bring to the table and how I can leverage everyone's strengths to get the best possible outcome. That's yeah, my it's so funny when I was I was taking down notes for this conversation and one of the things I have on my notes is I just wrote building collective energy is one of the things I wrote it's because I think when I see your work there's a lot of that even if it's just you like even if it's just you on the screen I think that there's a lot of as a viewer you're you're tasked with you know giving yourself to view what what you're viewing um and so I think you you talked about a lot of things that lead me to another work that I wanted to show and that we wanted to talk about um, two businesswomen trek to an undisclosed location. Um, yeah. And I think what's really interesting about this work is the site specific nature of it. Um, so I'm gonna show it and then we'll just jump into a conversation about it right after. Perfect. I, I struggled to think about where to end that clip. I really wanted to show the whole thing, but I, I think it's also something that people should go out on their own after this and explore. Um, I will have like a link to everything that we've talked about um, on Art and Practices website, so people can get a link directly to this. Uh, but can can you speak about it a little bit in your own words? Sure. So first off, I want to give an eternal shout out to Atika Green and uh, Asphodel, who are the two performers I worked with on this piece. Um, Atika Green, I auditioned and um, uh, she was wearing the black jumpsuit. That was my first time working with her and she was amazing. Um, and then Asphodel in the black and white polka dot dress uh, is an artist, dancer, performer, energy worker from Los Angeles who I've had the extreme pleasure of working with for a few different pieces. Um, so what they did uh, was extremely challenging uh, this is a piece that was commissioned as part of a, a public art project at Union Station in Los Angeles. And so I was thinking, I'm doing a site-specific proposal. What are train stations for? They're for getting from point A to point B. Like, what's the pace like in a venue like this? It's normally quite hurried. People are either like trying to arrive early or running late, or they're waiting for a loved one to arrive or something, but there's a really charged energy. And it's also really exciting because the Union Station as a landmark is the only Los Angeles landmark that's designed to take you somewhere else, which is interesting to me because um, you think most places you go to, it's like you go to the, the 
Griffith Park Observatory or you go to, you know, some park, but this, this is the only place you go to leave. So from that, I sort of took these bigger ideas and just uh, compressed it down to something really simple. I was like, okay, I'm going to take a really banal, mundane gesture, which is the walk, a walk, and put these two people that might not be out of place any other day, you know, a woman in a dress. Maybe she's going to work. Maybe she's meeting a friend. I don't know. My fantasy was I cast them as businesswomen. Um, and I put them on a walk, a choreographed walk from one side of the station to the other. And the goal was for them to try and get from one entrance to the other in an hour, which is just the amount of time I blocked off for the performance. Um, they made it about halfway through. Um, there was a few other directives I privately gave the performers, which I'm going to keep secret, but they had little beats to kind of hit throughout the work. Um, a lot of core strength <laughs> to walk that slowly. <laughs> yeah. And also too, um, the emotional focus required on both of them to stay in character for an entire hour. They weren't allowed to speak. Of course, they could speak if it was an emergency. Luckily, there wasn't one. And we, we had safety, like there's people working for the event if anything were to happen, but they were just placed in the station and everything you see with people gathering around them with cameras was all organic. Um, I requested when we made the piece to have no signage. There's no announcement over the loudspeaker. Um, if you knew about the event, uh, there was a website for it. It just said, Elliot Reed, two businesswomen trek to an undisclosed location, 2 p.m. That was it. So at some point during 2 p.m., the piece would happen and maybe you'd find it, maybe you wouldn't. But the kind of uh, fervor that generated around the performers, I think is just such a testament to uh, the, the skill and focus that Asphodel and Atika brought and just how through this really tiny gesture slowed down really I don't know. I, I love this. I love this video and I love that piece. There's a lot of gravitas to it and sort of takes on a different kind of um, meditative, potentially like sinister, kind of like under, otherworldly type energy. Yeah, even though if you it, describe it, a, it, a sort of like science, science fiction tone. For me. Like I, I like to think in my mind that they're they're traveling to another world or a place like that when I when I viewed it. Um, I think and I think that's the beauty of of working in the manner in which you work is that oftentimes it's left up to the viewer to perceive what they're seeing and, and, and how they should unpack what's happening. Um, yeah. And I think also the beauty of working with an ensemble, working with so many different people, um, when you're doing a site specific work like this, the public becomes a part of it in a really beautiful way as well. Um, and I think you really have shown in, in this talk and this conversation that we're having, how you think about all these different things, how you think about the duration and, and all of that um, how it goes together. I now want to show some images that you shared with me of a few different things um, and we'll kind of just jump into it. Mm -hmm. Hey. Okay, so this is a piece from 2018, I want to say, also done in Los Angeles, uh, called America's Procession. So this is a piece that I co-choreographed with the spirit of my great grandmother on my mom's side. So the grandmother who taught me how to play piano, it was her mom. So she was a musician, self-taught. She sang, she wrote poetry, and she even um, paid to have a record made. Uh, of her singing like devotional songs, which someone in my, I need to get my hands on a copy. It's somewhere, some family member has it. I don't have one, but um, basically when she, she was young, I don't remember exactly how old, it was less than 55, but she died while singing in church. And my whole family was there. Like, so my grandma was there, all of her siblings, my grandfather, the whole congregation. Um, so the story is like really traumatic, but as I was going through my personal history and thinking of sort of what might have been something that led me to be an artist, because my, my family is filled with a lot of different, you know, diverse thinking and smart people, but uh, my immediate family is all, all numbers folks. Like my, both my sister and my dad are, are mathematicians. 
my brother is a game designer and my mom has worked in banking since he was 16. <laughs> so it's really like a lot of analytical stuff. Yeah. Uh, so a thought I had was like, okay, so like where, where can I trace a creative lineage? Cause there are like musicians and, you know, like teachers and other people that do creative things in my life. And so through talking to my family and going through our archive, um, the story of America Bell Miller, which was, was her name. Um, I decided to kind of like invoke her as like a presence to help me move forward in my practice. So I kind of dedicated this piece to her and did this dance where I had all six performers memorize every part in the piece and each section, you can go to the next slide. So I think I sent you a couple of these. Each um, section of the artwork. Oh, this is the cast shot. Um, lovely, gorgeous, all of us. Oh, right to my, uh, my right side, you can see Asphodel who was in that last piece who I also worked with. A lot of people I work with multiple times, but uh, next slide, please. I think these are the only two I have. Okay. Uh, never mind. So anyway, uh, or you can go back to this one. So the person wearing the red dress um, in this picture, Dove Allende, um, her character had a bowl. And at the start of every section, um, Antonio Harper, who's wearing all white, who was the composer, uh, he would start a new section with a new song. She would come out and bring uh, the characters on a sheet of paper. And so all the actors in black had 10 seconds to pick a character. When the music started, they would perform. So the idea was that the piece could never be performed the same way twice because it was up to chance who would play who, which character when um, and for how long. And so with the story of the, art, uh, the artwork, which was also interspersed with a script that I wrote, the idea was that the spirit of my great grandmother, America Bell Miller was co-deciding with me or kind of directing, choosing when we opened the curtain, who would perform what and how. Um, and I just prepared the I just prepared the actors for anything that could happen. That's amazing. And from this experience, I imagine that it seems that when you're working and especially working with an ensemble this big, there's a, a before, a during the performance, and then after. And I imagine that this experience is very unique for a lot of people in engaging. Um, mm -hmm. So when you when you work with a group like this, is there a process that happens after where you kind of decompress what has happened and, and you all talk about the work that you've done together? We had a party. <laughs> nice. Um, <yeah. laughs> DJ by the the amazing DJ Bebe. Um, so that that was our that was the gift. I like when I when we did the budget for the show, I was like, I need, I'm like, I gotta have this DJ. I must, I must. And so I got I got my wish. Taking it back to the to the days of organizing shows. That's always a good one. Um, and, and yeah, yeah. I mean. And it was fun too, because everyone, everyone in this picture worked so hard, um, but also it, it was a moment where all the performers got to decompress, but it was uh, an after party for the show. So the whole audience was there and it was something that became communal and shared, you know, uh, for everybody. Amazing. And so I think we wanted to kind of end by talking a little bit about your recent work. And I think the next images I'm gonna show are of your most recent exhibition. Um, so I'll kind of just jump into it and we can start talking about it. Thank you so much. So these upcoming photos are from a show that opened earlier this month, or sorry, uh, earlier in September. So previous, it's October now. Uh, I have a show up in Glarus in Switzerland at Kunsthaus Glarus um, called Rhythm. And for this show, I did two large scale room installations. There's one upstairs called An Occasion, which is all white, and one downstairs, which is called Rhythm. Um, so for this work, uh, there's a series of gestures. Uh, I am not performing live in this work. There's videos of me and my body moving, but I took the, the museum as an opportunity to think about how the choreographic Im uh, impulse influences the way that I make artwork. So all the pieces are very like physical and sort of, even though there's not a, a person there, the way that they're made implies a certain kind of exertion or physicality or energy. So this is a close up um, of one part of the work uh, where a hundred knives are stabbed at a 45 degree angle into a wall. And at the tallest point, it's nine meters, which is a little, I think it's maybe 14-ish feet or so um, down to about like half a foot above the ground. And as you can see, we actually built a second wall in front of the stone wall uh and stabs a knife in so once the viewer comes in there this is on the back 
the far back side of the gallery. So it just looks like a faint gray outline. But when you get closer, you kind of witness the this history of violence or kind of exertion uh, that was required to make the work. Um, and the narrative kind of unfolds. Thank you. Yeah, this is the, the full shot of it. Um, also the single knife that's uh, on the left-hand side of this image, that's about six feet to give you an idea of scale. Um, yeah, so so yeah, thinking about how choreography can translate into objects and ways to, to translate energy and liveness, you know, into sculpture. So this picture right now, this green room, uh, green green walls, green ceiling, it's lit by green neon light. And I made a special audio clip, which you can't hear in the video, or you can't hear in this photo, excuse me, but it's an hour drone that I made from digitally layering my voice. Uh, and the effect, I guess I'll just describe it. When you're in the room, your whole vision is kind of subsumed by this bright green color. The volume's quite high. And my goal with the audio is to kind of have something that sort of like vibrates you to your bones a little bit. So this is like a very physical experience. Um, even though you're not confronted with any object, technically the sound is so present in the room that I kind of wanted it to fill, fill the space as if it was an object um, or something present, you know, even though it can't be seen. Definitely. And then this is a close up of a video from the white room upstairs with the knives. Uh, this is me trying to rearrange my face for five minutes, uh, just playing on an HD video loop in the corner. Um, obviously it's impossible. My features are kind of stuck where they are, but thinking of the body as material, I shot this up against a white wall and started to think about, okay, so I'm a performance artist who works with their body. Like if I was a painter and I worked with canvas, I have like a substrate or an object to speak through that I manipulate and create my image on. But what does it mean when your material is your own flesh? Um, and also with a bit of humor, riffing on the idea of what it means to perform inside of a museum. Um, this video is kind of like me treating my face like a sheet of paper, kind of trying to erase things, draw things, move them to different places. Um, I just interrogate that relationship of what it means to be a performer versus what it means to be like a, a more traditional uh, plastic artist. And then on the on the small monitor on the corner facing my face video, um, it's me jump roping facing towards a wall. So everything in this room is silent with the knives except kind of quietly you hear the sound of a jump rope echoing in like a, a loud tiled floor, which gives sort of like a, it's like a pulse in the room. It's a little eerie, it's a little abrasive, but it also um, is funny to me that the loudest thing in the room is also the smallest thing in the room. Uh, so uh, this piece at the bottom is part of Rhythm. Um, I wrote a proposal for this piece not knowing how to pay for it, but um, we got a sponsorship from Yamaha. Um, shout out to Otto, the exhibition uh, <laughs> uh, or uh, director at uh, Kunsthaus Glarus, but the idea with making a sculpture out of motorcycles uh, was what they represent to me in the world, which is just energy, power, noise, focus, um, but also in a very sensual way, a machine that's so intimately connected with your body. It's like you have to straddle these kind of sport bikes and lean forward. And even the curves kind of become like an extension of like your arms, your back. You sort of become like an alien or something when you're on one of these bikes. So I position them facing the entrance to the gallery. So the viewers are confronted with these four motorcycles in a small room, all facing towards you, but they're on stands. And then inside each of the bikes, I put an MP3 player and each MP3 player is playing a recording of sharp inhaling breaths. So it kind of sounds like this <gasps> at different pitches and different intervals, but I wrote the sound. So there's gaps of silence and because they're at an angle, it kind of echoes at different depths. So there's like another sort of physical element to it. And then each bike has a spotlight. It goes in descending color order from red, orange, yellow, white, um, which coming from the green room, it's sort of like a, a stoplight in reverse or something. It's like you, <laughs> yes, yeah, no, this is, this is the perfect picture for it. So you're confronted with the bike in white and then the red bike is closest to the door for the green room but you have to walk through the green room before you get to these uh, 
these bikes that are sort of like uh, frozen, artificially kind of uh, held. There's, there's a deep uh, charge or kind of potential there, which I feel connects with the work upstairs, with the knives, where it's like the history or the suggestion of a lot of potential energy that's kind of been like clipped or sort of contained. I wanted to kind of catch this feeling of like lightning in a bottle, um, like an excitement, something that's just about to happen, but hasn't quite broken open. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I'm working on now. Amazing. I think it's a very logical progression I can see from the work that you, that you talked about really early on and, and composing and thinking about creating compositions and now composing physical space, I will say, and then thinking about all these different elements. Um, I'm really excited to see where you take this in the future. I wish that I could get to the museum to see this exhibition, but I don't think it's going to happen. Maybe it'll like, tour. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I really hope so. And I think no matter what, I'm excited to see the next work that you make and really glad to have been in conversation with you. Thank you again for doing this with us. Um, is there anything that you want to add to the, to the end of this conversation? Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this program and to be an extended part of the conversation around Blondell's work. I think it's really exciting to be making art in a time when people are thinking more creatively and critically about what choreography is, what performance is, and how liveness, physicality, and presence factors into art making, especially now. So um, I wish Blondell was here now to get more of her flowers, but I'm glad that, you know, I get to keep working now. I can be part of this conversation and, and with your work and other people's work, we can kind of keep stretching, you know, what's possible in the now. Yeah, so. totally. Thank you so much. Yeah.